Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Our program is about to begin. Good afternoon, everyone. The daily announcements. For the karaoke sunset cruise tonight, please make sure you check in at the table next to the pier to swap your ticket for a boarding pass. I suggest getting there at about 6.30. The boat leaves at 7 p.m. It won't turn around for you, and it moves faster than you can swim. So please make sure you're there. There will be no refunds for slackers or disorganized people who miss the boat. There are still tickets available, however, so if you go down into the registration, they're available there. Uh, the boat is called the Spirit of Baltimore. When you go into the inner harbor, you can't miss it. If it has three masts, that's the wrong boat. Moderators, please keep to time. People have planned to see presentations in different rooms, and it's very difficult if you overrun or you move the program forward. If moderators, if a person has not turned up, leave a space, allow people to discuss the last presentation in that 15-minute slot, but keep to the time in the schedule, please. Um, speed poster presenters. Um, if you want to see a speed presenter uh, and go down to their poster, do it at the beginning of the session. Um, there are some people who will be going on the cruise and they'll have to be heading off at about 6.30. So please bear that in mind. If there are must-see posters for you, please get there early, just in case you miss your presenter. Don't forget the members meeting at 4 o'clock this afternoon. This is your chance to have input with, into what SCB does. Uh, for those of you who are receiving awards or coming up onto the stage, please don't, jump, please don't jump on and off the stage. It's a health and safety issue. Plus, also, you don't look terribly graceful as you fall onto the floor. We have lots of pint glasses left, and they're only $5 each. They can carry water or beer. It's up to you. Um, registration, if you, if you are leaving early and you are not coming to the final party and you have drink tickets, please pop them off at registration so that some deserving person can get extra drinks. Each one of those tickets is a drink we've paid for. If you go away and you recycle it, that's a wasted drink opportunity. So. If you, have, if you are leaving early, please come down to registration, drop off drink tickets. Um, if you have a spouse you want to take along to the party too, just bring them down to registration and pick up a ticket and a badge. We have basically blocked off an entire street of bars, karaoke, and various other um, nice activities for you to do but you will need some sort of pass to get it in there. We don't want riffraff like ecologists or something attending. Um, pub crawl hangover memorial t-shirts are available at registration. We have plenty of these t-shirts. Um, the pub crawl has made over $1,500 for the student travel fund. Thank you very much. And I will now introduce SCB President Rodrigo to introduce the awards. I'm using the steps again. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for being on time. Um, this is again uh, plea out there to please remember that you can be part of, this, of the life of the society. Think of those people that have marked your careers through uh, direct interactions or through reading some of their work or through their example. Uh, you all know people that n deserve to be recognized by our society. So please look in the website for 
the nomination form and nominate those people who have marked your career. Today we're giving out the Leroux Award. The Leroux Award is a, a specially um, um, created award within the society to recognize the innovative applications of science to resource management and policy by scientists. Um, this year's Leroux Awardee is Dr. Robin Weppels for his creative and productive leadership with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to define how the U.S. Endangered Species Act should be interpreted and applied to conservation. Robin? have 30 or 40 PowerPoint slides, so if we could start those. Uh, but actually, I would just like to make a couple acknowledgments. First, thanks uh, very much to Rodrigo and the Society for the kind words, to those who did uh, step up and nominate me. Uh, I do want to uh, acknowledge a few factors that definitely influenced uh, this award. First, nobody accomplishes anything like this in a vacuum. So I was very fortunate that I had a large number of bright, energetic, and dedicated, hardworking colleagues, both inside our agency and outside. Uh, and together, we accomplished quite a bit. So really, uh, the, uh, the things that we accomplished as a group, are, are they should, those people really should be considered uh, part of the recipients of this award. Uh, the second acknowledgement, I think, has to be uh, a bit of luck and good fortune, which is probably true in a lot of things in life. Um, I had the good fortune to arrive in Seattle not too long before this whole giant can of worms of what to do about salmon under the Endangered Species Act uh, exploded, and that was in 1990. And as it happened, I had a background that was useful for some of the early stages of that. And I went to one key meeting, so I knew a little more than everybody else. So it just snowballed, and uh, I ended up playing a big role in the process. But uh, that, that was actually just a confluence of a variety of things that I happened to be in the right place at the right time. A lot of people in their whole scientific careers will never just by chance happen to encounter an experience or an opportunity like that. Uh, the third thing I'd like to acknowledge uh, is the contributions of our agency uh, to whatever we were able to accomplish that's recognized in this award today. Uh, and it would not have been possible if National Marine Fisheries Service and NOAA had not placed a high premium on science and scientific integrity. And we decided, we arranged early on, very early on in the process, we developed a process for the science teams developing scientific conclusions that the policy people then took in it consideration, make, making the listing determinations and recovery actions. And we followed that pattern diligently uh, throughout the decade and a half that I sort of spent more or less day to day uh, working in the science policy interface on these issues. And a lot of the scientific conclusions of our teams were not convenient to our agency or to society. The listing, ESA listings of Pacific salmon uh, had consequences, economic consequences that are easily measured in the hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars. But not once in that entire time did we have anybody from uh, higher up in our agency try to fiddle with the science, try to demean the science, try to tell us what the answer should be ahead of time, uh, send our conclusions back and say that's not the right answer, try again and bring us a different answer. None of that happened uh, in my experience, again, for well over a, about a decade and a half of very intense uh, uh, interactions between science and policy. 
and I know you can read in newspapers and pretty much lots of popular press other counterexamples where that's not been the case in government agencies. So I just want to give our agency a lot of credit for the way they have handled this whole, uh, whole issue in my experience. And I just want to point out one final thing. There has been at least one very beneficial and probably unforeseen and unintended consequence of that was that during the 1980s, 1990s, when we had greatly increasing workload because we had more and more salmon stocks to evaluate, some were already listed, so we had to do recovery planning and so on. We had the opportunity to hire new people to help us in this project. And I found by the mid-1990s that even though these jobs were mainly uh, science support jobs, developing science to form the basis for listing determinations and recovery actions, I had to honestly advertised these jobs in that context. And I would say something like, uh, you may have, if you're really energetic and efficient and can get your main job done, you may have something like 0 to 25 percent time to do uh, primary research. And in spite of that, we found that by the mid-1990s, we were getting really top candidates coming out of PhD programs or postdocs throughout the country who could have been competitive for tenure track jobs at any university. They wanted to come and work in a place where their science could make a difference. And so this led to, I think, what was really a positive feedback loop where that increased the quality and visibility of our science. And that, again, then would increase the respect it was paid to by the general populace. So it was a sort of an upward spiral, a positive feedback situation. There was considerable benefit, I think. And you can, you can see how the opposite scenario where your agency uh, demeans science or tries to diminish it or have a minor role for that, that can obviously have a negative feedback. Nobody wants to go, and no, no top scientist is going to want to go work in a place like that. So uh, for those of you who have some influence at the higher levels of agency or government, I suggest pay attention to that because it's really important. Uh, placing high credence in scientific integrity is really good for the whole process and it's a positive feedback process. So thanks very much. And now to introduce today's plenary speakers, it's John Gigliano, the ICCB Conference Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce um, this afternoon's plenary. Just to give you kind of a uh, very short historical perspective. Um, the first plenary at this meeting, uh, we heard about we, uh, a discussion about how scientists helped formulate really landmark groundbreaking environmental legislation. The keynote panel told us it's okay to be an advocate. It is not a four-letter word, and some might argue it is our obligation to be an informed um, advocate. Yesterday we learned about the rocket model, how we can use effective, how we can effectively communicate and talk to the public about conservation. Today's plenary follows that theme, I believe, um, because we've learned how we can go beyond science, to use science um, effectively um, to help preserve the world's biodiversity. And today's plenary is on public participation in scientific research, or more commonly known as citizen science. This, is a, this has really emerged, I believe, as one of the most effective tools in our toolbox. It is a great way to engage the public, to educate the public, to get them excited about conservation. And 
it is actually a very good way to get a lot of, get really good quality data. Um, and if any of you went to this morning's symposium on citizen science, we've learned that um, citizen science is, and I quote, going viral. And it's also a great way to bring the public into the um, ivory tower. It is becoming so important and so popular um, that there's um, currently been um, formed a national association on citizen science. And I encourage any of you who are interested in citizen science to go to the website citizenscience.org or to, there you are, talk to Jennifer Shirk, um, stand up, stand up, turn around, stand up, um, who, if you're interested in citizen science or the National Association, um, she can provide you with more information. So with that, I would like to introduce our two speakers. Our first speaker is um, John Fitzpatrick, who is the director of the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology and professor in ecology and evolutionary biology at Cornell University. From 1988 to 1995, he was executive director of the Archibald Biological Station in Central Florida, and before that served for 12 years as a curator of birds and chairman of the Department of Zoology at the Field Museum in Chicago. He is fellow and past president of the American Ornith Ornithologists <laughs> Union, um, and in 1985 received its highest research award for his co-authored book um, on the Florida Scrub Jay, um, Florida Scrub Jay Ecology and Demography um, of a cooperative, cooperative Breeding Bird. He has served on national governing boards of the Nature Conservancy and the National Audubon Society, on three endangered species recovery teams, on numerous scientific and conservation panels. He has authored um, over 150 scientific papers, discovered and described seven bird species, and is co-inventor of eBird, one of the world's largest and most rapidly growing citizen science projects. Karen Cooper the, um, is a research associate at the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, blogger at Citizen Sci in the PLOS blogging network, guest blogger for Scientific American, and senior fellow in, environmental, in the Environmental Leadership Program. She is co-chair of the Publications Committee of this newly forming Association for Citizen Science. She is co-editor of an upcoming special feature on citizen science in the open access journal Ecology and Society. She has authored over 35 scientific papers, co-developed software to automate metrics of incubation rhythms, and is co-inventor of Nestwatch, Cam Clicker, Celebrate Urban Birds, Yard Map, and the House Spiral Project. Dr. Cooper can be followed on Twitter at CoopSciScoop, which is, well, it's in front of me, but not up on the, on, on the screen yet. So without um, taking up further uh, any more of your time, I'd like to introduce John and Karen. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, John. Wow, what an honor, uh, privilege to stand in front of this important group. Uh, I want to thank the society for inviting uh, Karen and me to give this talk. To be here in front of you, you are an amazingly diverse and energetic and uh, committed bunch. And it's a, it's a real thrill to be able to uh, talk with you, uh, uh, this group who are dedicating your lives to seeing if we can ensure that humans and natural systems can eventually live side by side compatibly. Um, Karen and I here represent, I want to say at the outset, a, a lively uh, group of uh, committed professionals at the Cornell Lab in Ithaca um, who are convinced that the idea of citizen science is here to stay. It is a, on a growth curve uh, that has no bounds. Uh, we're just at the opening edges of it, and uh, we're looking forward to sharing a bit of the journey uh, of the citizen science idea and encourage everybody in this audience. We, uh, we believe that n nobody is working in things that are separate from issues that can be addressed effectively uh, 
by Citizen Science. I do uh, want to uh, give a shout to, especially to Jennifer Shirk and Tina Phillips here, uh, two members of the lab who organized the workshop on uh, Saturday along with Karen and uh, also this morning's very exciting symposium. I need to start this, uh, this presentation with a, by paying homage. I'm an ornithologist, and I, I can't uh, resist starting by paying homage to, this is a good bird quiz, by the way, for you particularly North American bird types. How thin is that bill? That is a picture taken in Ithaca about 10 years ago, and it is an Eskimo curlew. It is an Eskimo curlew. It's definitively an Eskimo curlew. It's Cornell University's only specimen, which happens to be mounted so we can stick it in the, in the grass and get a picture of what this bird would look like if it ever came by Ithaca. But as you know, that will never happen. This is a bird that traveled by the tens of thousands across the central prairies of North America to its Arctic breeding zone, and then came through Ithaca and other places in the northeastern North America, crossing the Atlantic and wintering ultimately in extreme southern South America. We took them all. In the process of taking them all, this bird came to be known as the prairie pigeon. And perhaps some of you can guess why it was called at that time in the late 1800s the prairie pigeon because it was replacing the bird that I'm really here to pay homage to. It was replacing the most abundant bird that has ever lived on the planet. The passenger pigeon which migrated in flocks that sound like science fiction when we read them today. Two billion, three billion birds in a flock. The most abundant bird ever, we systematically took them all. And as many of you know, and as David Blockstein acknowledged on the first day of this meeting next year, 2014 is the 100th anniversary of the disappearance of the final passenger pigeon. So I can't talk about citizen science and the uh, glorious future that it has without recognizing how much we missed it by just a hair. Now, in honor of the passage of the passenger pigeon and its 100th anniversary, a good friend and uh, current artist in residence at the Cornell Lab, Todd McGrain, has worked with an animator. And so I believe uh, you're going to be seeing this for the very first time. Uh, they've put together an animation of what it might have been like to stand underneath one of these flocks of passenger pigeons. And if technology permits, sit back for a minute and 36 seconds and take this in. Market hunters descended on the colonies of passenger pigeons across their northeastern North American breeding ranges, 
first by the dozens, later by the hundreds, communicating with each other eventually by a telegraph, building railroad tracks to come in and haul the hundreds of millions of birds, adults and squabs away. And the existence of these market hunters was a source of pride to, uh, in a number of places. This particular picture is one of the very few that I've been able to find where, yes indeed, although there's dominated in this particular picture by geese and even cranes, right there you can see passenger pigeons hanging for sale. They were shipped by the hundreds of millions to the eastern markets for food. Writings about these colonies underscore the speed at which this process took place. This uh, Petoskey, Michigan, a famous occasional breeding locale for passenger pigeons in 1978, one colony covered 600 square kilometers. By 1981, a year in which 10 million passenger pigeons were shipped from that colony, that was the last year they ever nested in Petoskey, Michigan. Writings by state agencies when be people began to actually ask whether they should be protected indicated this view of the world at that time in the late 1800s. So prolific that there's no need for protection. They couldn't possibly be taken. I assume you're thinking cod. You're thinking bluefin tuna. Martha, the last one, disappeared at the Cincinnati Zoo on 1 September 1914. Next year will be her 100th anniversary of passing. How could we do this? How could it be that during a period of a couple of decades we could take a bird that abundant all the way down to the point where it couldn't breed successfully anymore? What if there had been a gas gauge? What if there had been a little meter that every year when people began to do the process of looking where the passenger pigeons were, the, they, they actually could check, well, well, this, well the tank's only three quarters full. Ooh, this year the tank's only half full. Last year it was three quarters. This year it's a quarter full. Maybe we should let them breed for a year or two. There was no gas gauge. Could, what, what would it have been like if we'd actually been able to see as we, as I'll tell you in a few minutes, can now, the actual incredible pulse of the southern to northern ranges of this bird every year and measure how they were doing and see the density, see the places, see the disappearance in action. What if there'd been that kind of a measuring device, a monitoring device? The problem is at that point in the history of North America, we weren't, we weren't thinking like that, were we? As a matter of fact, <laughs> some people were. People who worked in the oceans. This is a map. Um, of whales that was made in 1851 by Matthew Murray. He assembled this information. This, this information he found by going through log books from uh, past voyages of ships. And what you can see here, well, it's actually really hard to see, so I'll just describe it. So these are the oceans. And, and he divided these up into quadrats. And in each one of those, actually is a, is a graph by month of the number of right whales that were seen, the number of sperm whales that were seen, and also the, there's a measure of effort, the number of days that ships were present in those quadrats. So, so these kind of efforts of amassing and aggregating information from many, many sources, from many, many people's observations, was already happening in the mid-1800s. There's another example. Oh, wait, a little. Oh, right. So, and actually, uh, Matthew Murray was known for more than his whale uh, charts. What he was really known for was his maps of the ocean wind and currents, um, which I know is hard to see here. But when you read about um, his work, um, he was a naval officer. Usually you read things like this. It's his work describing seasonal wind and currents was conceived largely outside of conventional academic circles. Okay. What that means is, is that all the data that he got were from sailors. And um, 
So he started doing that basically by looking at old ship's logs. But as soon as he made his first map, sailors realized how great these maps were. And, they, and then he, when he asked them to submit, basically to make recordings in a way that he could easily access it, they did. He provided them with log books that they could collect all the information that he needed. It was information they were recording anyway, because um, they were like mobile weather stations. And he brought it together. And, the, and sailors loved this, because then they didn't have to rely on <laughs> or hope that they had a captain that knew those waters, because they knew that they could have a map that was basically an amalgamation of all the information and knowledge of all the sailors put together. And it made sailing safer, and it made it quicker. It used to take like almost a year to go from New York around South America to get to California. And with these maps, it was reduced to about four months. Um, so there was other projects, too. This isn't going? Oh. So another similar project, this was in 1835, by a British man named William Waywell, made these tide charts with the help of people all around the world. Okay, this was a field he called tidology. He liked to um, coin new terms. So he had people of all walks of life in 1835 uh, collect data for him, and this was synchronized. So on both sides of the Atlantic, he had hundreds of people organized, and at the exact same points in time, at 15-minute intervals, day and night, for two weeks straight, they measured the tide marks, and then they sent him all this information. This advanced our knowledge of tides so much, he won a royal medal for this work. And William Waywell was also, he wrote a lot about the nature of science, and was really there at a time when science was emerging as a profession. And, and it was always, it really had been sort of an elite activity that the privileged were able to do in their leisure time. And then it emerged as a profession, kind of became even more elite. And, um, and actually, his experiences working with and uh, gathering data from ordinary people kind of even informed a little bit of the hierarchy of how he portrayed science. So he, he actually coined the term scientist in 1840, to, sort of to describe this umbrella term of whether you did physics or or chemistry, or were a naturalist, you were a scientist. Uh, actually, he even had a term for the participants in his projects. He called them subordinate laborers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we could use that today. Um, but what he said was, he said, anybody can gather the pearls, the observations. These were the pearls. Okay. And then there was another layer he had in his hierarchy of uh, sort of people who are good at math, who might organize these pearls a little bit, and they might be paid. But then at the top were the scientists. And he said they were the ones with the intellect who could actually string those pearls together in a necklace. And so it's kind of ironic that he did this amazing research with the help of so many people, but yet he imposed this very hierarchical structure, really pushing science into a profession to be more elite than ever before. Oh, and so, and actually, so when I was growing up and realized I wanted to be a scientist, a lot of that was from uh, reading National Geographic or seeing National Geographic specials and have an idea of what a scientist does, of what science is about as a profession and what and how a scientist operates. And these were kind of the traits that I saw in a scientist, right? They were someone who worked alone, who went out with their binoculars and their field notebook, and they worked far away out in nature, away from the rest of us, deep, deep in the jungles. But they would come back occasionally, and they would use their individual passion and clout to save species and to save habitats. And that this was a very elite thing. Only a few really had the stuff to be able to do it. So I went through all those trials and tribulations of getting my PhD, because <laughs> I didn't want to just watch these on National Geographic. I wanted to do this. And then right after my PhD, I got a job at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology to do my research through citizen science. And what I discovered was that it's actually very different. I never work alone. Everything I do, all my research, is so highly collaborative. And it's not just that it's collaborative and that it's me and thousands, even tens of thousands, of bird watchers, but also the field itself is collaborative. 
with people from so many disciplines that support this process, from informal science education, communications, human-computer interactions, informatics, I mean, you name it, there's a whole host of fields that make it possible. And the research wasn't necessarily far away. It was very embedded, actually, in society. It was, it was where people are, is where it's happening. And, and it was people's leisure time and hobbies. And if you think about it, that's like a great place of where we want science to be happening, is right embedded in people's lives. Because then it releases this potential that it can be the collective passion and collective clout that can be used to save species and save habitats. And so instead of that being an elite process of science, it's really more of an egalitarian process. And it took me a while to make sense of that. I have to say, and, and once when reading uh, Stone Soup to my kids when they were younger, I thought about this. Are people familiar? Does anybody remember the story, this folk tale of Stone Soup? I see some hands. OK. It's, it's this, just briefly, it's a story. Well, there's a lot of versions. My favorite is this one. It's these monks that are traveling through a war-torn country. And they go into a village where everybody's kind of holed up in their homes. And they put a big pot of water, and they start cooking it, and they add some stones. And they tell everybody, we're making stone soup, and we're going to share it, and it's going to be good. And little by little, they gain the trust of people, and people come out, and they say, oh, well, here's some carrots for the soup. OK, I have some potatoes I can spare. Here's some cabbage. Here's some onions. And everybody contributes just a little bit. And in the end, they have this amazing soup that feeds everyone. So when I read this, I thought, Matthew, so these were these monks that put the pot out. And I thought, Matthew Murray, he's like the monk. <laughs> right? Because he had this map, this big empty map, and all these sailors tossed him information about the winds, about the currents. And he amassed it all, basically, to have this amazing map that everyone benefited from. And I thought, oh, I guess I'm a monk too. Because <laughs> bird watchers are giving me observations all the time. But this idea actually goes back quite far of collaborative uh, working like this. And it goes back really at, at least as far as Thomas Jefferson. Because when he was penning the Constitution in 1776, he was also collecting weather observations. He was a complete weather bug. He collected weather twice a day, every day. He did not like to have gaps. And in 1776, he, he was devising a plan where he wanted to deputize one person in every county in Virginia to do the same thing, to collect weather data twice a day. Okay. And, and he didn't, so the, the Revolutionary War kind of got in the way. But the point to this and to those big maps is really that all these kinds of global scale investigations um, and looking at these global patterns was possible way back when, without the internet, without smartphones, with people using stagecoaches and, and quill pens. Quill pens. The use of birds as tools and ornaments. This reminds us, of course, that by the end of the 1800s, birds had become enormously popular as ornaments, and the seeds of citizen science were actually beginning to foment. And one of the great heroes of the early activist movement in the citizen conservation story of North America is pictured here, Harriet Hemingway, who tweeted across Boston, as only one could in the 1890s, door to door, about the idea that, do you know that there are hundreds, thousands of birds being massacred to be able to decorate your hats? What a terrible, immoral thing to be doing. And little by little, across Boston society, high society, and ultimately across Eastern North American high society became suddenly a terrible thing to do. Audubon society was formed as a consequence of this citizen activism and the tweeting that could exist uh, in the late 1800s. And remember, at that same moment, with the last few passenger pigeons uh, uh, exhaustedly flying around, that was the moment in which the United States of America elected a revolutionary president. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who was actually a naturalist, a hunter, an explorer, a writer, a bird watcher. This is a president who was walking together with John Muir in the mountains of Western North America. Imagine that. President Roosevelt actually kept his own bird list 
in the White House gardens. We have records of that today, and we're in the process of putting that into eBird. But this is also the moment, again, uh, no doubt Roosevelt participated in this activity, the famous Christmas side hunt in which people competed, com competed with one another for the uh, going out during the holidays to blast as many birds as you could, see how many species you could kill for the Christmas table. And this is at that moment, early 1900s, 1900 to be exact, when this gentleman from New York, ornithologist, well-known father of, a, of a 20th century ornithology, Frank Chapman, said, you know, we should, do a, we should not do that anymore. We should try something different. Let's go out and do a Christmas count instead of the Christmas side hunt. And indeed, by 1900, he was writing this in his little magazine, Bird Lord. Only six years later, he wrote, my goodness, look what's happening. We're accumulating a massive exact information. Imagine this. It actually has real scientific value. The seeds of 20th century citizen science had begun. The Christmas bird count, uh, now uh, 3,000 circles around the Western Hemisphere, 15 miles in diameter. Bunch of crazies go out for a 24-hour period, any time over a two-week period, count everything they see, compile it in an organized fashion, uh, and uh, report the results. And the results of the Christmas bird count were among the very first uh, efforts in which pu putting together thousands of observations from thousands of places began to be used for understanding real population issues, such as the one illustrated here, the dramatic and ongoing decline of one of our charismatic North American birds, the Bob White. Passion and knowledge and commitment and activism coming together in 1900 to create this thing which 60, 70, 80, 100 years later, we're now using actively to uh, prioritize species and places. Passion and knowledge and activism certainly characterize another of the heroes of the 20th century in ornithology and in conservation, Chan Robbins, who uh, said, you know, we should do something like the Christmas bird count, but let's do it during the breeding season and let's organize a scientifically valid way of sampling across a large number of areas. He invented uh, the North American Breeding Bird Survey, a survey no doubt familiar to many people here, a series of point counts uh, a quarter miles apart along carefully pre-directed uh, routes uh, throughout North America. The Breeding Bird Survey now, of course, uh, become one of the most common ways of addressing issues of population change, both regionally and range-wide. The example shown here, a very common backyard bird throughout North America, the northern flicker, to many people's surprise, represents one of the most rapidly declining birds across the entire continent for reasons we're still working on, but we're working on it because we have a gas gauge. We have gas gauges that are pretty darn good uh, in particular areas around the range of this bird. When we start thinking about ecosystems and ask questions, for example, about the nature and extent of, of, of high plains, short grass prairie in the western North America, we use indicator species like this mountain plover. And when we see species like this undergoing decadal long uh, steady declines, it allows us to begin to focus energy and attention and prioritization on issues both on the breeding ground and the wintering ground of birds like this as indicators of ecosystem health and well-being. This is now becoming commonplace across uh, uh, ecology, uh, uh, spearheaded not by elite scientists, but by the fact that we have this enormous army of people who are willing to spend their time out there looking at nature. Look at the numbers, the surveys that uh, show how many people around the U.S actually enjoy active observations of wildlife across the landscape. The surveys every five years done by a joint uh, a group of agencies show remarkably consistent results, very robust surveys, something on the scale of 50 to 70 million people annually spend time watching wildlife by taking a part of a day or a day trip or more to do it. That's an enormous army. Imagine the idea that we can start capitalizing on the energies of that scale army. This idea that citizen science is uh, unique to the 
bird watchers of North America is no longer true at all. There are programs of citizen engagement, citizen science, counting and monitoring using birds all over the world at this point. Uh, hundreds of different projects, uh, many, many dozens of countries that now use it actively. But what the heck is it about birds that makes this happen so uniquely? There's so much more to see besides birds. <laughs> Actually, uh, there's citizen science with, with virtually everything you can possibly imagine that you might observe. I guarantee you there's probably a citizen science project on that topic. Not beyond birds, bats, turtles, butterflies, dragonflies, um, microbes, mites that live on your forehead. Right? There's a project on that. You can, there's a YouTube video. You can see E.O. Wilson getting his, the mites on his forehead sampled for a citizen science project. Um, there's everything. Nurdles, the little microplastics on the beach. Um, noise pollution, light pollution, weather, everything. Uh, because science is empirical. It's based on observations. And people love to make observations, and people love to share observations. So right now, citizen science happens. It's emerged really independently a lot of times in, in so many different disciplines, in ecology, behavior, medicine, microbiology, natural resource management, urban planning, environmental justice, astronomy, meteorology. And the thing is, you might not recognize it in all those different fields because it's got a zillion different names and acronyms, public participation in scientific research, volunteer monitoring, community-based research, participatory forestry, community mapping, PPGIS, um, do-it-yourself science, street science, participatory action research, I mean, the list goes on, crowdsourcing, meteorology, they don't even really like to have any name. <laughs> We've assigned a name of public participation in the scientific method for weather. I'm just kidding, because the acronyms get, like, really crazy. But the point is, is that, in, is that it exists in, in a lot of different forms and styles in all these different fields. And, and it's been around a long time. And we can actually look, if we look hard, we actually do see it. If we look at what we know and how we know things. How do we know the climate's changing? Well, actually, like I said, Thomas Jefferson was trying to start a weather observer program, a citizen observer program, and it didn't work out then. But by the 1850s or so, the Smithsonian had started one. And after the Civil War, President Grant started one that the government runs that goes on to this day. And that's where a lot of our climate data, our weather data come that help us understand climate change. How do we know birds are breeding earlier? The workings of the tides, right? I talked about Waywell, that there's a Jupiter-sized planet that could support life orbiting another star. We'll talk about that in a little bit. That periwinkle can treat diabetes. Or how do we know that right now, that there's about 50 types of microbes living in your belly button? So, a lot of people would say, oh, well, we know these things because scientists learn them. But actually, there's other ways of knowing, right? There's indigenous knowledge, and that periwinkle example is an example of indigenous knowledge. Pharmaceuticals were able to hone in on that because that was indigenous knowledge. But all these other examples, they have some element of citizen science in them. What we know about this, these wouldn't have been possible if it had not been for some degree of public participation in that research process. And these are just a few examples. These are ones that I happen to have blogged about, so I put them up there. But this list could go on and on. Um, so I think we might give scientific or scientists a little more credit than they deserve. So there's, so I mentioned all those different styles of citizen science, and we could kind of imagine them on these two dimensions. Um, the, the bottom axis I've reversed, it's, it's volunteer investment, like how invested uh, the volunteers are, from high to low. And we could also envision it on how dispersed, like physically dispersed the network is. Right? So on, on one end of the axis there at the high end is uh, DIY, that's do-it-yourself science. Right? So that's maxed out in volunteer investment. If you're doing it yourself, you, you can't really invest any more than that. It's often very localized, but not always. So that's one end of the spectrum. And then the far at the other end of the spectrum is crowdsourcing, where someone might spend literally like five seconds helping on adding their little bit to a project. And that sort of can trans... It can happen any place, right? It can, it's on the web. It sort of transcends place. And then in between is a whole spectrum of different styles and types. And what I'm going to do a little bit now, and when it's my turn later, is, is, give, is share some stories 
of, these, of different examples of these styles of citizen science. So the first, we'll start with do-it-yourself science. There's one hub of do-it-yourself science called the Public Lab of Open Technology and Science, or PLOTS. So the Public Lab um, is awesome. They're really a community of makers, of tinkerers, people who like to invent things. Like, after the um, tsunami in Japan, they were, they were starting to make plans and to teach so that anybody could make like a do-it-yourself Geiger counter, right? They, they make all kinds of equipment for environmental monitoring. And one of their trademark uh, things that they, that they provide, I guess it's not up there, are these balloon and kite mapping kits where you can attach a camera, or sometimes they'll even tweak these cameras to make them infrared, to a balloon or a, or a kite to take aerial photographs. And this is what they get. So you can see that there's one image there on the left uh, is an is a image of this area from Google Maps. And then you can see on the right, a much better resolution, is this area from a map from the public lab, from their balloon mapping. And these were used extensively with the Gulf oil spill. People use them around Superfund sites, anywhere where they want to monitor pollution. People use them in other countries to monitor for illegal logging. Um, the re and the resolution is great. And I've heard that Google Maps actually now has a, has a deal with the public lab to bring their maps into Google Maps for that higher resolution. Okay, that's just a little peek at do-it-yourself science. So now at the other end of the spectrum is crowdsourcing, really, which comes to us from the business world. Raise your hand. I'm just curious if anyone here in any context has participated in crowdsourcing. Okay, this is better than I get for most. That's not too bad. What, like 25% maybe? Okay, well, how many people have ever done this? Raise your hand. Where you go to a website and they want to make sure you're a human. Yeah, like almost everybody. <laughs> they want to make sure you're a human. And so they show you these two words that optical recognition software can't read and you got to type them in. Okay, so when you've done that, when it's two like that, one is so that they can tell you're human. In the other word, you're helping digitize a book. Right? It's a big project to scan books. Yeah, you're, you're helping digitize a book. So they're scanning books, and whenever there's a word that the character rec recognition software can't read, they put it out to recapture, and someone spends literally two seconds helping transcribe that book. So that's crowdsourcing in the general world. <laughs> and uh, yeah, pat yourself on the back. <laughs> so, so, but it's the same idea behind Galaxy Zoo, okay, which is this project of of hundreds of thousands of images of galaxies that were taken by a robotic telescope. So when people go on there and, and, character, and their software can't recognize which, which way the galaxy is, which way the spiral is going. So they need, it takes a human brain to classify these images. And when someone sees those, they're likely the first human eye to ever have seen that image. And so people go in and they tag these. And there's been heaps of publications of new discoveries of galaxies that, are, that have happened. And oftentimes the people, the ordinary people, who have helped find those are on those scientific papers. So the idea behind crowdsourcing, and kind of behind citizen science in general, um, was articulated really well in Clay Shirky's book called the Cognitive Surplus, this idea of cognitive surplus. And what he says there is that since about the 1940s, we have more free time than ever before in the human race. And I know you might not feel that way, but we have so many amenities and so many things that make our life easy. We have a lot of free time. What do we do with it? Well, okay, so these boxes show you. So the large box, that's the 200 billion hours that U.S. adults collectively spend watching TV in a given year. That little tiny box, do you see it there? That represents the 100 million hours that it took to collectively make the content in Wikipedia. Okay, that's a weekend, that's about the amount of time that we watch commercials on a weekend. Okay, so, but the idea is, is that people actually don't want to spend their time on these consumptive acts of watching TV, but on creative acts of sharing, like Wikipedia. So the idea is that that big box is actually going to get smaller, while that other box is getting bigger. So people want to do creative acts, they want to share, now, some of that comes out really frivolously in things like LOL cats. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think that that is scale. I didn't really scale that, <laughs> although it might be close in the amount of time people spend. Um, but not only do people want to do creative acts of sharing, 
They want to do meaningful acts. They want to have their free time spent toward a bigger purpose. And that's where citizen science comes in, in projects like Fold It, right, which is this puzzle. It's this three-dimensional protein folding puzzle that people do that hopefully will help cure AIDS. Or actual games. In Citizen Sort, there's an actual video game called Forgotten Island. You just play this game, but then at some point, to get from one level to the next, you have to do like a tagging sort of thing, like in Galaxy Zoo. Right? So there's a lot of gamification in citizen science as well. Anyway, but this concept of cognitive surplus is probably why Zooniverse has been such a success. Zooniverse is a hub of crowdsourcing for citizen science. They have over 800,000 people who have participate in the Zooniverse in these crowd, oh, sorry, these crowdsourcing projects. And they range, they started out with astronomy, but now there's, there's tons of biology projects. Because you can go, you can help identify animals that are on the sea floor or code whale songs, or bat calls. Um, th there's heaps of projects. You should explore uh, the Zooniverse. We, the lab has a project that we're going to be uh, having in there soon. Zooniverse has this project called Notes from Nature, which are heaps and heaps of information and specimens from museums, from herbariums and whatnot, that need transcription. And we, at the lab, have about 350,000 nest record cards that are literally these little index cards, and each one is information on a nesting bird that dates back uh, into the 1900s. And, uh, and so those records will get transcribed by people who are volunteering in the Zooniverse. But I don't want to give the impression that crowdsourcing is only this really kind of, you know, potentially monotonous things to do like transcription, because crowd ideas can be crowdsourced too. And I, and I really like this example from the Belly Button Biodiversity Project, um, this is the one that discovered that we generally have about 50 microbes in our belly buttons. And it sounds really frivolous, but you may have heard of the hygiene hypothesis. This idea that the reason, as a society, we have so many more autoimmune problems and allergies than ever before is that our world is too sterile, that we're disrupting our microbiome, right? We have naturally have microbes in and on us, and our ster sterile world might be changing the diversity of our microbes. So, so this project, uh, the Belly Button Biodiversity Project, is sampling microbes in the belly button because, frankly, that's kind of the area that gets washed the least often. And, and, what, and you can see, well, maybe you can't anyway, anyway there's, they discovered so many more microbes than they ever imagined. I mean, thousands of new microbes. And they had initial hypotheses that they wanted to test with whatever kind of microbe patterns they found. But most of them didn't pan out. They did recently publish a paper on pets. It turns out if you own a dog, then the microbes in your belly button are a little bit different than the microbes in someone's belly button who doesn't own a dog. <laughs> but, um, but really, they were stumped. And so they went to the public and they said, hey, give us your ideas, because we don't know what might, you know, and they even, they said, here's the data, give us your ideas. And people came up with some amazing hypotheses and ideas about what might explain the diversity of microbes on our bodies. Um, and I, I won't go into those, but I think it was just a really exciting thing that the public got to be involved in this very creative side of science. And I wanted to just talk briefly about indigenous knowledge, too, because there's, because um, that is another way of knowing that's now also sort of intersecting with citizen science. Um, because uh, there, with really rapid environmental change, there's some systems of indigenous knowledge that really aren't working anymore. So in this Inuit community, way, it's like one of the most northern communities in Canada, um, their indigenous knowledge really isn't working in the face of rapid global climate change. And so they're adopting a lot of citizen science techniques to collect new data in collaboration with scientists. So not only are scientists going there and actually trying to understand the indigenous knowledge so that they can look at it and say, why did it work? What were the drivers that made this, ha this work? And then also enlisting people and training them to collect the data they need to feed into their current climate models. And, um, oh, and there's a lot of papers that are coming out about that as well. And I think that kind of highlights this role of technology and how valuable it is to us in sharing knowledge, right? I think, so how many people remember the movie the gods must be crazy. Okay, how many people liked it? And, and people really liked it, right? This was like this awesome movie came out. And at the time, it kind of spoke to sort of a feeling in the environmental movement, perhaps, 
that technology maybe was bad, right? That there were some problems with it, it can disrupt things. And I, I think that's changing now, because we're seeing that this actually can be a useful tool. So, I mean, it was a great movie, I did love it, but let's face it, it's total fiction, right? Because what really happens, oh, I went too far, well, whatever. It, when you give a Bushman technology, like this GPS unit, is that we can preserve indigenous knowledge, right? So that middle picture, that's um, a Bushman with, with this special device called a cyber tracker. And, uh, and this is a non-literate community, so there's not words on that GPS unit, it's um, images, but it's so that he can record indigenous knowledge related to his ability to track animals. And then the other picture are pygmies, very disenfranchised communities of pygmies in the Congo, who also use these devices to map the areas that are, spe that are ecologically important to them, trees and streams that are important, so those can be fed into uh, forestry management plans. So there's many ways that our modern technologies can be used to share knowledge for good ways. There's tons of apps in citizen science that allow us to watch and observe, right? And, and not only to watch, but also to act. This is an example from the Bronx, a highly polluted area, um, where people, which is mostly from truck traffic, which, is, which people observed and were able to reroute trucks. But they're using these apps, actually, to map out um, and to spot and map out places for planting, tree planting opportunities. So what about birds? You, you got an app for that? Yeah, great, great to mention apps because this amazing passenger pigeon range map that I showed earlier was created with apps. For real. It was created in part with this one that's now available uh, for each one of you, for all the places that you might visit in the world, to interact with a citizen science project and put in your observations to help create maps like this. And as you no doubt have guessed, this is actually not a map of passenger pigeons. We didn't get to do that in time. This is actually a map of the annual cycle of the field sparrow, genuinely created by an ongoing citizen science project uh, that we're very proud of and we now believe that it's the largest one in the world. Uh, this is the project uh, called eBird that we co-invented in the late 1990s with friends at the National Audubon Society and we're now managing at the Cornell Lab. This idea that anybody, anywhere, anytime can put in their observations either by an app or through a conventional internet computer connection Went global in 2010. There are now about 150,000 active eBirders around the planet. We're now uh, at around 136 million observations uh, and growing. And uh, no doubt the largest uh, taxon-based database on the planet at this point. We're getting information in enormous volumes. I just went in a couple of days ago in preparation for this talk and asked the question, uh, recent observations of the American robin in the Baltimore area uh, and got this map for the year 2013. The red dots in here are the most recent last two weeks. Uh, just illustrating the fact that, uh, of course, common birds are common in this area. Um, but more importantly, we're getting a rather high density of uh, real data uh, it for birds and uh, multiply this by about 10,000 species of birds around the world. We now have data from every country in the world and almost every species. One of the most common questions we get is what about bad data? Uh, a number of conversations about that this morning in the symposium on citizen science. In the case of eBird, it's a, it's a combination of dispersed and command and control because we have actually relationships with now uh, 800 and climbing individuals who, uh, who are prepared to receive flags that come from uh, database data submissions that have a potential to fall outside of a customary level of uh, numbers or a customary uh, distributional zone for a particular species. How do we know what those are? Originally, we made them up on the basis of expert opinion. Today, 
uh, now in a, in, and I'll make reference to Rebecca Moore's presentation yesterday in, in the, about how Google is working. We have uh, great relationships with computer scientists and applied uh, machine learning specialists and we're actually increasingly allowing the data, uh, incoming data submissions themselves to teach the program itself what the norms are to be expected. And when a record falls outside of that norm, it's flagged. And that flag needs to be cleared by a regional expert familiar with the place. Uh, every individual sends an email in so that we can actually contact them for uh, specific information if one is particularly interesting. We get good records confirmed, we get errors corrected, and uh, importantly in the spectrum of science versus education, all of the individuals who play this game, myself included, learn during the process. Uh, this slide just emphasizes the fact, the wonderful fact, I hope it keeps going for a long, long time to come. We're at a 40% annual growth rate. We're now getting something on the scale of 350 to 400,000 checklists per month from around the world. Uh, as I said, from every country in the world at this point, of course, uh, still largely dominated by North America and uh, parts of South America. But the real point here is that we, this project and others like it have begun to enter the privileged phase of science in the petabyte era. That is the challenge that we have of garnering so much data that we really have to begin to apply 21st century methods to actually make sense out of these data, make analyses of these data that really actually do the job that we need to do, namely pinpoint issues, uh, trends, movement patterns, and so on. And so it's very important uh, that we, uh, we're very fortunate, I have to say, that we're partnered uh, at Cornell University with one of the great computer science departments because what we now can do and have begun doing and we're at the only opening emerging ends of this is to put the observations together with coverages, several hundred of them, having to do with land use, having to do with climate, having to do with effort on the part of the individuals uh, and uh, various kinds of remote sensing technology to be able to combine the observational data put in by citizens with the uh, spatial data supplied by all of these distributed databases, data sets, and begin to apply 21st century machine learning models uh, through the use of high performance computational power. In the case of eBird, uh, in a couple of projects that I'll uh, show you a slide from, uh, in a sense, well, the Field Sparrow one being an example, where we used uh, through the good graces of NSF, three million hours of the TerraGrid in the process of creating these week by week, uh, very detailed models for distributions of birds that you see there on the right as an example. The result is nothing short of revolutionary in terms of how we now view bird distributions as dynamic entities, spatially and temporally, We've changed our view of how birds are distributed. We are now beginning to learn things that even the most expert opinions on North American birds had never known. I'm showing you, uh, I know this is sacrilege to any Baltimoreans here, but I'm showing you the, the orchard oriole. Um, uh, a very, very interesting bird of Eastern North America. And we learned something profoundly new when the first time, the first time we looked at this model, there's a picture of the breeding distribution of the orchard oriole as of the 3rd of May. As you know, uh, in southeastern North America, they're breeding uh, long since by this point. Population of orchard orioles. You can see, by the way, the uh, distribution of cities uh, on this map. The orchard oriole uh, prefers to live outside of cities, and indeed, they show those show as holes in the map here. But look at this map. Just one month later. The breeding distribution of orchard orioles includes two other populations distinct and geographically separated from that southeastern one. This had really never been commented on before uh, in the literature on orchard orioles. It probably is the case that these birds come from different parts of the breeding range. Um, this again is information that's just coming out and becoming uh, available for analysis. The point is visualization of these data 
humans are a visual species, browsing very complex information with visualizations like this supply us enormous insight about new questions to be asked. Importantly, I emphasize this idea that this is how historically bird books and even modern websites describe the breeding ranges of a charismatic North American warbler, the prothonotary warbler. Those are what we think of as the ranges of this bird. Are you ready to see what the actual breeding range of this bird is? Here you are. Very different from the blobs on the map. And from a conservation, I'm now beginning to uh, try to zone in on the purpose of talking about this with this group. Because once one starts to recognize the detailed heterogeneity of distributions, the places of concentration, the places of less uh, concentration, you now can begin to zone in on what is important for this bird and what uh, is important year after year versus only in certain years as a consequence of uh, seeing things in this detail. Remember, these data are created, this map is created strictly as a consequence of people reporting prothonotary warblers on checklists and combining those reports with coverages on the ground to create these models, the predicted distribution model for the prothonotary. Of course, in the conservation, we're particularly uh, interested in and concerned with species that are showing rapid and dramatic declines. The western meadowlark is one of these, a bird of the uh, characteristic of the uh, Great Plains grasslands, a bird that is undergoing significant declines across its range. With the aid of these maps, we can look at the, kind, at the exact places where this bird is most abundant, not just in its breeding ground and then its wintering ground, but also places along the way that the bird depends upon uh, for migratory stopovers. We can also, as illustrated by this uh, fairly simple example, look at the habitat associations of these birds uh, in relationship to their, uh, their numbers, their preferences, and also how this varies through the season. Uh, we can visualize this for every species of North America at this point. This graph just shows you that uh, in terms of using human housing density, indigo buntings really don't like it hence those pock marks in the range map of the indigo bunting during the breeding zone. But of course, the chimney swift now has converted completely from old cypress trees to human chimneys, of which, of course, the density is highest in cities. So you can see the inverse pattern as mapped by the uh, model in the, lower, uh, in the lower left, the model of the chimney swift breeding distribution over the last several years. Associations with habitat variables at any scale a couple of uh, very recent uh, uh, advances in modeling the global patterns, or at least the hemispheric patterns. This shows you the black-throated blue warbler in its wintering ground there in the central Greater Antilles, its migratory pathway going up through eastern North America to a few very uh, concentrated breeding uh, centers in its breeding distribution up in uh, southern southeastern Canada and extreme northeastern U.S. And then uh, coming back down, you can see those red lines correspond with the, I mean, colored lines correspond with the colored boxes. Back down basically through the same breeding uh, migratory pathway through Florida, out into the central uh, greater Antilles, and finally back to that huge concentration in eastern Cuba and western Hispaniola. Very interesting contrast here uh, with a uh, not too distantly related bird, the black pole warbler, which winters more in South America. Watch its northward movement across the Caribbean through Florida, the Bahamas, up there into the eastern and central Canadian boreal zones. Watch its winter, uh, fall and winter movement, not the same route, but instead back across the Atlantic Ocean through the eastern part of the Greater Antilles, coming into northeastern South America and finally back to its wintering grounds. This is at the opening edges of being able to model these. As more data come in and as the machine learning specialists get better at finding the algorithms for, uh, for varying the analysis with density of data, these will get ever more precise and refined, we have the opportunity to look at the world a completely different way. We've now begun to use these in the, in the context of converting these data 
and the insights about these data to uh, on the ground land management practices. We used the uh, first series of models of the kind you just saw to inform the 2011 State of the Birds report, uh, uh, specifically attending to the question of public lands and what proportions of which of the high priority species were uh, most uh, proportionally associated with which of the public agencies owning land in the West. So we could literally give hand directives to the various public agencies, particularly federal agencies, as to which species they were most responsible for protecting. I want to say as an aside that when we talked about this conceptually in the 1990s, one of the highest up people in the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, told us, I don't want to know things like that. And I'm happy to say that BLM is now out in front and actually asking specifically and contrasting contracting particularly for this exact kind of information so that they can know exactly where the species of most concern are on their properties. The most recent State of the Birds report just came out. Uh, if we can bring that slide back up, thank you. Uh, this one, a mirror image of that one, but this one treating private lands, uh, specifically working forests, ranches, grasslands, and so on, with the same basic idea, namely handing landowners, private landowners, specific uh, points about the birds uh, and ecosystems in which they could make the biggest difference. My final example, I want to drill down to the very, very tiniest scale. And this, I ask you to view literally as an example, because this is the very first example of this at the level that you're about to see. And my view is there is no end to the ways in which the, we can eventually use these models. This is a partnership uh, project with the Nature Conservancy in California, in which they're particularly uh, interested in the Central Valley. Uh, and its role as wintering habitat for migratory waterfowl. Uh, you're seeing the Central Valley tipped on its side there with the Bay Area down at the bottom and a few species of waterfowl that use it there. And as uh, everybody here no doubt knows, the uh, Central Valley is largely agricultural, but of course it's still used by a large community uh, of migratory waterfowl. Uh, I'm going to focus for this example on the Northern Pintail, which is one of the species of ducks that is not uh, increasing recently, but instead is uh, gradually declining. Many waterfowl species are actually doing pretty well right now. The northern pintail is not. The uh, question is, can we improve uh, habitat for this bird on its wintering ground, which we know to be very important for the species? There's the range-wide distribution of the northern pintail in June. Here's the uh, modeled uh, distribution of the northern pintail in the Central Valley from midsummer on into the winter. You can see beginning in September, they start to appear in numbers. They clearly are concentrating themselves in a few places within the Central Valley. By November, they're getting more and more common. They're filling it up, so to speak, in December. And by the middle of the winter, the numbers there are quite large. It is, in fact, North America's most important wintering ground for the pintail. And as many of you know here, by March, they're beginning to move north again, migrating again. Okay, so you just saw a, a uh, modeled uh, distribution of the pintail based on data. This is perhaps one of the most important slides we've seen in the process of uh, developing these, this, this science because the Nature Conservancy, before going whole in, wholly into this, wanted to actually ground truth our model. So they radio tagged a bunch of northern pintails. And what you're seeing here is the radio tag data in purple overlaid on the eBird uh, modeled distribution of pintails in white. You can see the uh, correspondence is very high, and all of the ground truthing that we've done, albeit not as much as we'd like to eventually right now, uh, suggests the same thing. These models are, uh, are remarkably good at actually pro project, uh, projecting exactly where we'll find birds. This is important in the case of the con uh, Nature Conservancy, I'll just quickly say, because a big area in northern Central Valley uh, is dominated by rice farming. You can see the basic cycle of the rice farming year there in uh, a a vertical uh, uh, writing. You can see ba vaguely behind it the uh, shadow of the pintail uh, annual uh, arrival and departure cycle. In fact, there are several other ducks that basically have that same uh, pattern. And the issue there is that 
Rice farmers don't typically flood in Northern California until very late in the fall or early in the winter, November, December. But the ducks, the waterfowl, and cranes and so on are arriving much before that. Is it possible that they could have a relationship with the working landscape, the agricultural uh, owners and companies out there, to flood at a period with, that would actually make a bigger difference for the waterfowl as they arrive? The Nature Conservancy now in California is working on some extremely interesting uh, experimental uh, relationships with private landowners to do exactly this, thereby improving the communities that they're, uh, that those working landscapes are supplying for the uh, waterfowl that use them for part of the year. It turns out, if you look at the three places in the Central Valley that are well protected by uh, refuges, they don't correspond all that well with the big area in Central, uh, Central Valley where the waterfowl really use. Two of them do. Uh, but there's a big area that is outside of protection. Uh, the issue is, of course, important because so much of that area is private lands. Uh, if we can establish a relationship with the private landowners, uh, everybody can gain. The same can also be true for other non-waterfowl species, such as this very high priority uh, curlew, which is not extinct yet. Uh, the long-billed curlew, incidentally, every curlew species in the world is currently declining. Um, something about curlews. And in California, the long-billed curlew will be benefiting from this exact same uh, process. I want to conclude my remarks by just saying I have a privilege of being able to show you my place. This is where I get to uh, look out at the uh, hills of the Ithaca area in the morning in the fall. Of course, it looks like this a lot of the time. Um, but I want you to just take a second and, and don't look at this as my place. You could close your eyes if you want. You could think about your place. Conservation is fundamentally place-based, but it's also crowdsourcing. Everybody has a place. You have a place. Every human being has a place. Imagine the idea that we begin to garner the passion that people have for their places and put a little information into the common good so that we can begin to learn real time about the changes that are taking place there, whether it's birds or butterflies or belly button lint. The point is it's not about the rare birds, the about to be extinct birds, it's about the common birds. The common birds tell us so much information as they change through time. And our goal is to use relationships that people have with nature. Birds, yes, but as Karen has been talking about, there's lots of other kinds of relationships with nature. What about the idea that we can garner that relationship that people have with their places and put that information together in the common basket and have a genuinely new relationship with planet Earth so that we have now, using human sensors, created a real-time monitoring system that it will be necessary if we are to live side by side uh, with a functioning natural system. You guys are a nice audience. <laughs> so I just have two stories and then a cartoon. OK, and then we'll be done. So just speaking of place, there's many citizen science projects that are very place-based. So one of those stories that I wanted to share was a community-based research project that I visited last summer in North Carolina. This was the Wrightsville Beach Sea Turtle Project. Right? It started like a regular citizen science project, kind of. It's run by the state, because the state only has two biologists to monitor this endangered species, all that stretch of, of coast of North Carolina. So they have about 700 volunteers who do that beach monitoring. And they actually kind of co-manage those turtles, right? Because it's really the volunteers that decide whether a nest needs to be moved or whether it needs to be protected from light pollution or whatever. But what I found when I went there and I met the volunteers, you know, they patrol the beaches in the morning. Well, I can guarantee you that you can walk on almost any beach in the morning and you're going to see a lot of trash, right? You don't notice it when it's full of people. But you go in the morning, you're going to see it. And people that do this kind of volunteering, they're not bystanders, right? So they start picking up the trash. Well, one of them, this woman named Ginger, she started talking to people and other volunteers, and she realized that everybody was picking up the trash. So she said, hey, I got an idea. Let's start our own citizen science project. We got this. Let's quantify how much trash we have. So they started, they started uh, this Wrightsville Beach Keep It Clean. And they standardized their protocols. Right? They, picked, they decided that they would use, ironically, uh, little plastic uh, bags, and they would report how many plastic bags they filled each each time they did their monitoring. And they would report that to Ginger. And then Ginger would uh, 
she would add all that together, tally it up, and, and report back each week. And she started notifying the town board. They liked that, then they knew where to put enforcement. Anyway, eventually it got, the town board got to this point where they started talking about how to use tax dollars. All of a sudden, everybody said, no, 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 no. We don't believe your data anymore. <laughs> so they actually had to modify their protocols. So now they don't just pick up the trash. They take it home, they rinse it, they sort it, and they photograph it. Okay, and, and it was really interesting what happened with this. They got really familiar with, with basically with what they were picking up. They got pet peeves. Some of them couldn't stand the straws. Some had real pet peeves about bottle caps. Anyway, so, so not only did they start using this to inform policy, they got a ban on cigarette smoking at the beach, for example. They came really close to a ban on balloon releases. Um, but it started to, so a lot of the people that I met there had started to eliminate single-use plastics from their lives. And once they had started taking that kind of responsibility, they started to expect companies to do the same. They had pressured local businesses to stop using single-use plastics. They learned about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. They brought in Captain Charlie Moore to talk about it. They started raising community awareness. And so my point here really is that um, what often happens in citizen science isn't just that the data are useful in either informing policy or advancing research, but the process that people go through in collecting data actually can be transformative and, and can lead to great change and empowerment. Another really final example that I want to give is a type of citizen science, you could say, called participatory action research. And this example is also in North Carolina. I visited here, Tillery, North Carolina, in uh, February. This is a hog farm. Um, these, these are kind of like chicken factory farms, but they're industrial hog farms where anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000 hogs are in a building in these little pens. The gas is blown out, the food is piped in, and the waste is, is piped out into a pond and then sprayed across these fields. Okay, it looks like this from above. There's more pigs in North Carolina than there are people, and they're concentrated in these little, them and their waste are concentrated in these areas, these little hog farms, thousands of them, um, next to really uh, rural towns. And basically, they're, they're in this stretch of North Carolina that's not on the coast and not in the Piedmont, but right in between. It's kind of known as the Black Belts of North Carolina. It's, it's basically where, where it's rural people, people of color that live there. Okay, so this is really a situation of environmental racism. That means that's when the disproportionate brunt of pollution from an industry is affecting uh, like a community of color. So, um, so what happened is these hog farms really started uh, more in the southern part of the state and started working their way up. Okay, and then, they, then there was one proposed in this town named Tillery. So Tillery is a, was a resettlement community. Okay, that means it was an FDR New Deal community when FDR was trying to get people to be farmers again. And he had white resettlement towns and he had black resettlement towns. And Tillery was a black one for, for, for black people to become farmers. And, and ever since then, it had a long history of environmental activism. So when a hog, one of these hog farms got proposed near Tillery, that's, you could say, the hog waste kind of hit the fan at that point. Okay, so some of the people that I met down there, on the top there is Gary Grant. He was raised in Tillery, and now he runs this really vibrant community center. People come from all around to Tillery to be part of this community. Um, he and, and the woman on the bottom there, Naima Mohammed Saladin, she's a community organizer in nearby Rocky Mount. They started looking into this and realizing that there were so many health effects being reported associated with these. And it's not just that they smell bad. I mean, to be anywhere in this area literally just smells like you're living in a port john I mean, the kids get off the school bus, they cover their faces and they run into the house. Everybody's got to keep their windows closed, their doors closed. Um, but there's a lot of health effects that have been reported, and this is in communities that already have high rates of heart disease and hypertension. Anyway, so they go to the state government, and they, and they say, we think this is a problem, we want their, this to stop. So what do you think the state government says? They say, prove it. Right? They don't put the burden of proof on the industry to prove that it's safe. They put the burden of proof on the people to prove that it's a hazard. Right, so how are ordinary people supposed to have access to scientific process, scientific methods, so that they can show whether this is a problem or not? Okay, well, that's what citizen science offers. So they contacted Stephen Wing in the bottom there. He's a professor of public health at UNC Chapel Hill. And they devised a plan together. 
So Stephen put up these little trailers that measure air pollution, automated, in, in several of the different towns. And Naima went and recruited volunteers and trained them to take self-health uh, self measurements. Right? And they tried to make these as objective as possible. Saliva samples with date and time stamps, automated blood pressure samples, lung capacity measures. And there were some subject subjective measures too, you know, where your eyes watering or whatever. Anyway, and they put these together. Stephen got all the data. He put it together to see how things coincided. And what he found was when there's a peak in hydrogen sulfides from the hog farms, there's a peak in all these negative health symptoms. And when those sulfides go down, people's symptoms go down. And they published a lot of papers on this. They also used maps to document these patterns of environmental racism. And so then they were able to take this to the state, along with a lot of activism. And they were able to get a moratorium on these open set pool spray fields. And it was really here that I realized how radical science could be, and especially for people who are not happy with the status quo, who can see that there could be something better. Um, and also that, that knowledge conveys a lot of power. And that's the kind of power that we need to share with the scientific method. So I just want to say that I think citizen science, we actually could see it. It's part of this larger trend toward opening knowledge. What I mean is that today's generation is growing up with things like Wikipedia, Creative Commons, or here's copyleft instead of copyright. Right? People today are used to the idea that information and knowledge is freely available. And that's not really what we're used to in the academic community. But I think that this issue was highlighted earlier this year with the tragedy with Aaron Schwartz. And I don't know, I don't know if people are familiar with Aaron. As a, as a kid, he invented Reddit. As a young adult, he was an internet activist. And, um, and what he did was he went onto MIT campus Basically, and he, he basically went to JSTOR, which I think we're all familiar with. It's where all of our knowledge is. He didn't like it to be behind a paywall. Uh, he downloaded it, and he started making it publicly accessible. Right? And he, it wasn't for profit. He was making a political statement. Um, anyway, it, it ended very tragically. Um, and I think that highlighted for a lot of people, like this, this uh, editorial in The Guardian says, uh, it says, hiding your research behind a paywall is immoral, right? They're saying we have a moral imperative to share the knowledge that we have. Um, you know, and that's why there are journals now, like PLUS, that are open access, that are based on this idea, which I hope all academic societies will, will think hard about. Um, you know, and, and all of this, I mean, if you think about it, this was really about just sharing the results of science that was happening off in the ivory tower. But with citizen science, what we're talking about isn't just sharing results. We're talking about making that whole scientific process accessible and available to the public. Right? So, so earlier this week, um, in one of the plenaries, uh, Tyrone Hayes introduced this quote uh, from Einstein, which was, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. And what he meant by that was that we as scientists have this privilege, and so we have a duty to know. And I kind of want to flip that around and say, why is this? <laughs> and say, we need to share that privilege, or maybe even think of it as a right <laughs> um, to know, to be able to gain knowledge. Because knowledge is power. I think we've seen that now. And I mean, we talk about citizenship as rights and responsibilities in governance. When we talk about citizen science, that's rights and responsibilities to participate in the scientific process. So I'm going to just conclude to sort of summarize this. I've made a cartoon to share. The story of citizen science. It's like the story of stuff. But anyway, so I'll read it. The story will be told by stick people with the following disclaimer. We do not only represent skinny people, nor only white people, nor only bald people. Um, we're generic stick people representing humans of every shape, age, ethnicity, race, and gender. We tell the story because at our core, we are all the same. Many people wonder where knowledge comes from. In the status quo, scientists make knowledge in this black box. And then science communicators translate and deliver new knowledge into everyday language of stick people, the humans. Here's some new research on avian olfactory receptor gene repertoires. 
That's a real paper. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Okay, that means birds can smell. <laughs> With citizen science, we tear down the black box and we work together because we have a lot in common. We all make observations. We are all curious. We can all experiment. We all think. We are all creative. We are all motivated for discovery. We all enjoy doing things. We all share what we know. And when we face big problems, scientific knowledge is not enough. We need each other and the social capital that we get from discovering together to use the knowledge to find solutions. So I just want to end because there was one with Matthew Murray's maps, because there was one thing I forgot to tell you uh, about these charts, and that is that this system, it didn't stop. It continues to this day, right? But it's not called citizen science. In 2005, it became an online system. It's run by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. They're not really known for their citizen science or their public participation. I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever heard of this group. The only time I ever heard of it was that they provided the intelligence to find Osama bin Laden. <laughs> okay, that's, that's who runs this. And, and, and the point that I want to make here, kind of going back to the stone soup analogy, is that, is that the process of making observations and sharing those observations basically just became so embedded into what it meant to, to be a sailor. Because of course it made sense to share them and to use that collective knowledge because then everybody was safer and, and everybody was healthier. So, so it became so embedded as a part of the, what it meant to be a sailor that it just isn't called citizen science, it doesn't go by any name, it's just simply what you do. And I think that's a vision that, that we have for citizen science is that making observations and sharing them observations of the status and the health of the world around us, that should just be a daily part of what it means to live on this planet together. It should just be embedded in our lives. And, and when that happens, it's not just that everyone will be a citizen scientist, everyone will be a conservationist. Thank you. Unfortunately, we won't have time for questions. We need to um, repurpose this room for the members meeting, which I hope you all attend. Uh, but please find Karen and John um, as they walk around, and please talk to them about citizen science. I just want to make, a, I've been asked to clarify one of Chris's announcements. The final party at Power Plant Live is included in your registration. So you do not need to purchase an extra ticket for that. However,